Looks like a lot of people must be sitting in on the judges' opening talk. I think that's going on right now. It's kind of unfair because last night he told you guys that some of you are going to die in the public square. <laughs> so I think a lot of people are like, uh, tell me more. I'm kind of curious. Let's see, Paris Agreement or learning how I'm going to die. Let me think. Although, ironically, many you know, interventionists would say, this is how you're going to die. So it's actually, um, I'm going to be doing, telling you how you're not going to die, put it that way. So let me just uh, sort of frame this for you, know where I'm coming from here. In the beginning, so I do a lot of work for what's called the Institute for Energy Research, uh, and it's a free market think tank that specializes in energy issues. If you want to see more on this stuff, just email me and I'll send you a bunch of links. And so a lot of what I'm going to do here is just, let me, let me back up a minute. When I started working in this area of climate change economics, I sort of had this idea based on the rhetoric that I was hearing from, you know, the, the, the interventionist side, the one that thought governments needed to take aggressive action to limit the emission of greenhouse gases. And they, you know, they like to use mantras like the science is settled and don't be a, a science denier, you know, which sort of sounds like Holocaust denier and that sort of thing. So I sort of had this idea that, oh, I was gonna go into this debate and I would have to, you know, oh yeah, I'm sure all the, you know, the mainstream science would, would justify all of these really aggressive government policies that people were pushing in the name of so-called science. And then I was going to have to go find, like, you know, there's a guy like Richard Lindzen at MIT who is what, what's called a skeptic and so on. And that, that's what I thought I was going to be doing. And it turned out that's, that's actually not what I've ended up doing in terms of the, my, my sort of day job, as it were, in this, in this field. It's just people will say, oh, this is what we should do. And I'll go read the reports issued, like, by the Obama administration working group on this area. Or I'll read the UN's periodic reports from the IPCC, that stands for Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And lo and behold, I found, wait a minute, no, their own reports don't justify the policies that the people in charge of these programs are saying, oh, we have to do X, Y, and Z, or the government should do X, Y, and Z because of the science. And you find out, no, what they're telling you in their own reports as the science doesn't justify what they're saying. So I'm going to spend maybe like the first let's say three-fourths of this, just explaining that situation to you just so you can see how crazy this whole thing, how Orwellian it is. And then at the end, though, I will sort of say, okay, what, what's the specifically Austrian take on these matters, all right? So that's the, the framework here we'll, we'll go over. Let me just mention, this is the first time I've talked to you guys in this capacity for this week. Let me just, I've, I've noticed this in previous Mises U, and it's happening here as well, so let me just mention something. I see people, they'll go up to somebody and, and have a book and be like, W would you mind autographing that? As if somebody, you know, is going to say, "Oh, I'm so sick of the paparazzi." Just I'm trying, I'm trying to teach economic. We're not cool guys, all right. This is like the one week of the year where we're special. So don't be at all afraid of coming up and saying, "Can I take a picture with you?" or "Can you sign this?" That's fine, all right. We we were, we're like reading economics and stuff. Do you think we were the cool kids in high school? We weren't. <laughs> Peter Klein thought he was, but he wasn't. All right, so. Another thing, just to re just emphasize how cool the Mises Institute is, this is a true story. So I uh, was the, the bellhop or whatever, you know, the, the kid that in the hotel who takes your, your uh, luggage in and so on. He was helping me load up my stuff. You know, I had a bunch of hangers and stuff for the, for the clothes, and he was helping me load that and bring it to the room. He's asking me what I'm doing because I have suits and things. He says, what are you, a business person? So I said, oh, I'm here for this conference. And he's, oh, I, I study economics. And I, it's really hard, and so I'm trying to get him to, you know, start getting into Austrian economics. And I said, oh, well, you're in town. He, he's not an Auburn student. He went to a different school, but he's around. He works at the hotel. So I was saying, well, you know, they're kind of busy this week with the conference, but yeah, you should check out what the Mises Institute does. And I was trying to explain where it was, and I said, well, it's on Magnolia. And, he, and I said, oh, well, it's, um, you know, it, it's next to Mama Goldberg's, you know, that and he knew that. And I said, well, it's the building right next door. And then I realized I had the grade. I said, it's the building next to Mama Goldberg's that looks like the X-Men mansion. And he was like, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. So just think, I mean, I think that's a good analogy. And since we're going down that path, you know, somebody associated with the Mises Institute, somebody associated with the X-Men mansion. I'm, look, I'm not saying I'm Wolverine. I'm just saying if one of us were Wolverine, it would clearly be me. That's all I'm saying. All right, I'll, I'll move on now. Okay, so what is the Paris Agreement? Just to make sure we know what the, the context is here. So on June 1st of this year, uh, President Trump announced that he was withdrawing the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement. On the next day, people began freaking out, okay? And actually, it was that day, but in terms of the print things, you know, coming out in newspapers and stuff. And just, you know, in case you think I'm exaggerating, I'm setting up a straw man, 
you cannot believe what people were saying. Just to give you one example, so Stephen Hawking, the physicist, said Trump pulling out a Paris Agreement could push Earth over the brink. In other interviews, he said because Donald Trump did this, Earth might turn into Venus, all right? And in terms of you know, the, the, the heat and so forth, in case you don't, Venus is hotter than Earth typically, right? So that is uh, you know, pretty, pretty over the top rag. Although having said that, I should mention that uh, a few years ago, Stephen Hawking also warned that artificial intelligence could end mankind, right? So guy's kind of a buzzkill all around. But anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to say that this, I'm grabbing just to give you a specific that was pretty provocative, but I'm saying the, the rhetoric you were hearing from people like, oh my gosh, uh, you know, it, People were almost saying things like, our grandkids are gonna be underwater now because of what Trump did, all right? I, I'm, I'm just exaggerating a slight bit. Things like, geez, Trump even has children. You would think he would not you know, take these measures that would ruin the fate of future generations. And so not just, hey, I disagree. I think this is a bad move. No, it was literally what Trump is doing now imperils humanity itself, all right? And so that's what I wanna say. There's so many things wrong with that sort of reaction it's, it's comical, okay? And so let me just spend some time explaining to you just how crazy this is, because again, the, the, the terms of this climate change debate that Americans are hearing, I'm sure it's probably similar in other countries for those of you who are from other countries, but I, I can't speak to that with authority. Whereas here, I mean, I've been working in this field for a while in terms of the, the context of US political battles in terms of the economics of climate change. And it is just stunning to me how far removed from reality these debates are. And then when the people who are for intervention just keep wagging their fingers saying, oh, you're just, you know, you gotta look at the facts. Oh, I'm sorry if, if the empirical facts are inconvenient for you and that sort of thing when it's like, no, I'm fine to go ahead and rest things on the facts, but you, you, the facts that you even stipulate. So anyway, we'll, we'll see here now some of the uh, issues. So what is this thing that they're talking about in case you don't know? So it was negotiated under the UN auspices by representatives from almost 200 countries and they were working on this thing for a while, and then in December of 2015, they had agreed on like the language of this agreement, all right? And then the countries started either signing it and or ratifying it, all right? And so in terms of various countries and how, how do their governments uh, react or respond to something like this, a document like this, you know, they could sign it like the person whoever the ruling official is at the time, like a prime minister or a president or whatever, you know, the executive branch in terms of our terminology could go ahead and sign the thing, but then they might have further hoops that their governments go through to ratify something of this nature. All right, and so, the, so you can see um, how it's been doing. What, now, there's lots of stuff in this thing, obviously. It's a, it's a huge document, but up front it says the primary aim of this is to hold total global warming to well below two degrees Celsius and to pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, so this is a point I'm gonna come back to, so just keep that in mind. It, in general, in this climate change debate, it has somehow become just uh, commonplace, like just obvious. Of course, we need to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. So by the way, that, what that refers to, it means relative to the pre-industrial era benchmark. Okay, so in terms of what they think the average global temperature was circa 1750 compared to now, and that's how much global warming there's been. So they're saying we need to limit that cumulative figure to two degrees Celsius at, at most, right? So they're saying clearly we don't wanna go beyond 2C, and they're saying ideally we wanna shoot for closer to 1.5C. I don't wanna to forget to say, let me just mention just the hubris involved in this, okay? So I mean, just if you're somebody, who, yeah, I don't really know that much about this, but the idea that we have a bunch of representatives from governments meeting to determine, like, what's the thermostat we're gonna adjust for the planet? I mean, that's how these people think, okay? So that should just give you some idea of just the, the inflated opinion of themselves and their abilities that they think they have. But like I say, it's, that's almost too easy. Like it, it's, you know, you're tempted just to say, oh my gosh, you guys talk about central planning. Now you're gonna plan the plant's temperature, give me a break. Yes, that's great. And I'm, that's why I'm saying it to make sure we, we hit that point. But even on their own terms, it's not like their case makes internal sense once you grant the premise that, yeah, let's say that, we, that it makes sense for us to talk about the temperature in the year 2100. It, it, it doesn't follow, even if you grant them their own premises. All right, but that's what they're trying to do. And the mechanism for doing this, because th this is really the, the problem, right? So on its own terms, the fact is, okay, there's this alleged huge negative externality that uh, 
economic processes left unregulated by governments are going to allow for the emission of a large amount of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, so forth, and then that causes the concentration of those gases in the atmosphere to go up, and then it acts like a giant greenhouse effect, right? So sunlight can come in, but then the heat can't get out, just like in a, in a real greenhouse, and so the earth gets warmer than it otherwise would be. So just so you know, that it's necessary for life, for that thing to be there. If there were no greenhouse effect at all, we'd all be dead, right? So it's the idea, though, is that, oh, this is actually just pushing us beyond the optimal point, and it's, it's making things eventually worse for humans. And so in, in standard Pagovian economics, uh, you know, named after Pagu, in terms of externality analysis, this is, has been called the biggest negative externality in human history, all right? So the idea is when you're driving your car, you're not fully internalizing the true cost to society of your actions because in addition to you know, using up crude oil and the workers who have to work to you know, process it and refine it and give you the gasoline, there's also the fact that you're imposing damages on future generations and they're certainly not a part of that transaction of you buying the gasoline and driving your car. Right? So that, that's the idea that the market price system is not fully capturing the true social cost of your activities. So that's why they, they have all these plans to limit it. Art, you know, I would say artificially, to augment the, the penalties of just the market price. So the problem with then, okay, let's say we all agree on that, or a bunch of governments, what are we going to do? The problem is, okay, we can talk about what would be the right trade-off to make at a global level. Like, in other words, oh, humanity as a whole is emitting too much beyond the optimum point. If only we could get humanity to scale back by such and such. But then the issue is, even if you could agree on that, which if you think about it, that's kind of a hard thing to get a bunch of people to agree on anyway. I mean, if you've ever been part of a, a big group that's trying to decide to go to a movie or to order a pizza, you can see you know, what a pain that is and how compromises have to be made. And there's different, so imagine having a bunch of things from 195, or sorry, from close to more 200 countries deciding, okay, everybody, how hot should the earth be in 2100? What do you say? What do you say? You're right. I mean, that's a crazy question. So, but even if you could agree to that, then the issue is, okay, now how are we going to get there? Because in order to achieve that, given the, the science, the, you know, the empirical cause and effect relationships of how nature works that we're just taking from these climate scientists as a, as a fact, just to stipulate it, okay, but that means what? Is, are the advanced countries going to all of a sudden screech to a halt and, and have no growth at all? Are we going to say to China and India, you know, yeah, actually, having modern uh, industrial systems has worked out pretty well for us, but sorry, you can't do it. You know, you, you have to slow your growth because, yeah, sorry, the plant's at stake, and you know, too bad, hey, you should have industrialized 200 years ago. How do you feel, right? You can you say that? So you can see how just apportioning the responsibility of meeting this target that they all agreed to is problematic. So the, the mechanism they use to get consensus in this is they said, oh, the, the agreement itself is not telling each participant what you're gonna do. It's just saying each participant unilaterally tells us when they join, when they sign on to this thing, this is what our intended nationally determined contribution, INDC, is gonna be. Okay, so that's what you have to do in order to sign on to this thing, is to say, here's what we're gonna do as our contribution to hitting this shared goal of clearly keeping global warming under 2C and ideally trying to keep it closer to 1.5C, okay? So, what could go wrong? Okay, so one thing is, why do we keep calling it the Paris Climate Agreement and not a treaty? Because doesn't it sound kind of like a treaty? This thing that a bunch of countries are agreeing to and it's gonna limit their actions in order to achieve a mutual goal, doesn't that seem like the kind of a thing that treaties normally do? So why are they doing this? Well, it's because um, this way, the Obama administration can agree to this thing, can sign it, and so, oh, yep, the US is one of the signatories of this thing, but they don't have to have the U.S. Senate approve it, right? Because the Senate has to approve an actual treaty. And that's what actually happened with the Kyoto Protocol, which was something that was negotiated in the, during the Clinton administration. And so Clinton you know, was all for it, but they knew the Senate wouldn't ratify it, and so they, it never actually went to a Senate vote, right? So it was like the U.S. was a signatory of this thing, but hadn't actually ratified it. And so, especially back then, the U.S. was a bigger player in the world scene economically, and so everybody knew if the U.S. doesn't sign up for this thing, then it's pointless, right? And so the Kyoto kind of was dead in the water because of that. So looking at their mistakes from what happened here, the people, when they crafted this Paris Climate Agreement, realized, ah, it's not the Paris Climate Treaty, it's the Paris Climate Agreement. Kind of like 
if you know U.S. history, the, what we call the Korean War, I believe at the time the U.S. government referred to it as a police action or something like that, right? Because if it were a war, it would, there'd have to be a declaration and, and so on. So that's, okay, so here we go. So Obama's happy about this. <laughs> so in terms of, you know, how would uh, the U U.S. Fe feel about this or how, how would Rothbardians, let's say, feel about this idea of the government using, you know, changing labels and so on just to get around what the Constitution clearly requires. So again, what they're doing is sort of getting the U.S. to sign on to this international agreement, sort of ceding sovereignty in a way so that even the legislature now can't have any input on this. I think this kind of sums up what the re reaction would be. <laughs> it was funny. I was Googling for this because I, mean, I knew it. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll put it in Tom's. But, and I couldn't find it. I was Googling like sad Tom Woods and it wasn't coming up. And I was like, what the heck? And I realized what it, it turns out, this is grumpy Tom Woods, right? So if you're trying to find this, it's a, you go to memegenerator.net. He's got his own meme. That's how big the guy is. But it's, it's grumpy, and you realize, yeah, that is grumpy. It's not. I have trouble with emojis also. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about these, these promises that are part of this agreement. So again, the way they, because you might think, well, gee, wow, that's amazing. And I had some people saying this when I was writing sort of giving a qualified defense of what the Trump administration had done on this one issue to say, yeah, what he did makes total sense. There's no way the U.S. was going to go, oh, this is a crazy thing. It's bad for Americans using their own data. You know, I'll get into some of these numbers in a minute. And some people were, were pushing back, and, and they were saying, no, this is amazing that you got all these countries to agree on this. Come on. You know, and, the, and part of the way they did it was because there were no, uh, th th there was no penalties, Right? So in other words, they get everybody to say what their contribution is going to be, and then if you don't even meet the thing that you unilaterally said, this is what our contribution is going to be, nothing happens to you. Right? This is a purely symbolic thing, so that's partly how they got, wow, this amazing historic agreement among all these nations of the world, and look at humanity coming together to meet this common foe of, of climate change. It's because there's no penalties in this thing at all. Right? It's purely symbolic. So that's, that's one issue, and then it's amazing Part of the way what the critics were doing when, when Trump took this step in order to show what a moron he is, is they're saying, Trump's talking about how this is a bad deal for the United States. Well, that doesn't even make any sense because there's no penalties in this thing. So the U.S. could just blow right through, you know, the pledges that the Obama administration may just violate them and nothing would happen anyway. So why did he want to just stay in it? So do you, do you get why, how duplicitous that, that on one hand, Trump is, you know, ruining our grandkids' chance at survival and on the other hand, there were no penalties for staying in. He could have just, you know, we could have just developed and, and whatever anyway and violated our own, the pledge that was made on the Obama administration and no big deal, so why didn't he stay in? So that's just how, how topsy-turvy this whole thing is. Incidentally, when I do this, just a note on notation, my son's been playing chess lately, and so if you ever looked at, like, the notation they give for chess games, if they give an exclamation point, usually what that means is, this looks like it's a stupid move, but really it's a brilliant move, right? It's, it's smarter than you realize. When I'm using it here in this talk, it means this looks like it's a stupid move, but it's even stupider than it looks like, right? <laughs> if you studied it as much as I did, you would realize how crazy this is, right? So my point again here is to say, when you think through the logic of what they're saying, that no, Trump should have stayed in because we could have just violated those pledges anyway. Who cares? There was no, I mean, it just shows you that why are they, you know, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. When Obama signed this thing and came back, he was the toast of the town, all, you know, the real respectable people. And so, oh, this is such a great thing. We're so glad we have a man of science in the White House. And he's, and then when Trump pulls out, everybody all of a sudden says, this thing had no teeth anyway. There was, it was just purely symbolism. What's the big deal, right? That, that doesn't, those two don't go together. All right. So also, if you look at what their pledges were from the various countries, because again, it's not that the agreement said, okay, we're going to try to limit it to 2C, closer to 1.5, you know, if things turn or break our way. China, we want you to do this. India, we want you to do this. U.S., you do this. Europe, that's not what it said. It just said, when you, if you want to agree to this thing and participate, you tell us. What are you going to do? It's non-binding, but you just tell us. You're, that's why they call it the intended contribution. And so when you start looking at what some of these countries agreed to, it's hilarious. So China gave specific numbers and, and things in terms of, uh, you know, like the, our carbon emissions per unit of GDP. And where, but when you look at the trend of what's happened before they agreed to this, arguably they were just saying what was probably going to happen anyway. All right? so they, but at least they were saying something official, whereas the funniest one, Orrin Cass uh, noted this from Manhattan Institute, 
He said that what, if you look at the wording that the Pakistani government used, they agreed to cut emissions after they reached peak levels. Think about that. I'm giving you three exclamation points, so that should be a flag. Wait a minute, don't just move on, think. What the Pakistani government was agreeing is, yes, we will reduce our emissions after they peak. Everyone see how, why, that, that's a definition. That's not a pledge. Yes, of course, once emissions peak, they're gonna start falling. That's what it means that they peaked at that level, okay? They're not saying a year or anything. They're just saying, no, at some point, our emissions will peak, and then from that point forward, we will have lower emissions. That's what they're agreeing to. <laughs> All right. I, I, had, I knew I had to keep hitting it to make sure you really got it. All right, so, uh, so th you, you start to see now how crazy this was and the fact that Trump pulled out of it Again, this is not, you know, there's lots of stuff the Trump administration has done that I'm totally opposed to, but on this particular issue, what he said made perfect sense, and the fact that so many people were screaming bloody murder just shows how the, the debate on this issue, at least the United States, is completely crazy. Okay, another thing people would say is, no, this is horrendous because you need U.S. leadership on this. The U.S. is a huge country, you know, it's all this prestige, and now Donald Trump just ruined everything, and... And some people were, like, were linking it to like military action and so forth. They're saying, because now we lost credibility on this issue, that Trump has gone back on our pledges, that you know, were made on the, you know, no, no other country can trust us. How are we supposed to fight ISIS now? Right? They were saying stuff like that. And um, so just to, to walk through it. Now, one thing in particular, some people were saying, like this, so this isn't for everybody, but there were, you know, I can show you articles, this isn't a straw man, of people who were making arguments like that that, oh my gosh, now this is all gonna fall apart because you know, without the US doing it, clearly it doesn't make sense for the other countries to do it. They're not gonna you know, hurt their own economies by restricting emissions. If the US isn't gonna do it, that's pointless. So this is it. You know. And then they'll also say, Trump is being a fool because now China and uh, some other countries are gonna get the jump on us in terms of advanced solar and wind technology. And so they're gonna corner that market. And so really, you know, Trump's shooting ourselves. He wanted to create jobs for American workers or whatever. Well, gee, now we're going to miss it on all these jobs for solar uh, panels and wind turbines. Right? So they're, again, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. It's like, okay, so if being in this thing is really great for your own economy and Trump just doesn't see that because he's an idiot, okay, so the other countries will stay in out of rational self-interest, right? The fact that the U.S. pulls out doesn't mean they should pull out if we take your argument seriously. So again, they're trying to have it both ways to say, I mean, think about it. Why wouldn't it make sense for the other countries to go in and participate, even if the U.S. doesn't, unless the critics agree with Trump that being in this thing is bad for your country? Okay, so uh, uh, what, I, what I'm saying here, you could consistently say, and, and some like actual PhD economists who are in the climate change debate in favor of these sorts of measures, they do at least, they're at least coherent. They will say, yes, being part of this thing makes us poorer than otherwise, but as long as enough countries could all agree to do that, then we would all be better off than if we each do what's in our own interest. So it's sort of like a prisoner's dilemma thing. So that, that at least is coherent. But again, some people were trying to even go over the top and say, being in this thing would have been good for our economy because it would have you know, promoted efficiency, houses would have had more uh, things to make sure they don't leak heat and things like that, and that would be great, and companies would save money. I mean, just to give you another example in this area that just popped into my head, you have people saying, I want the government to have stricter regulations on efficiency standards so that like a big building, you know, a company heats its building, and if they just installed more insulation, then they would save on heating and air conditioning costs and we want the government to force them to have more such efficiency measures than they're voluntarily doing right now. And it will save them money, so really don't listen to these right-wing critics. So the way I, what I say to them is, if that's true, you don't need a regulation, just take, up, you know, take your op-ed or your white paper and fax it to the companies. And say, look, you can save money, and they'll say, oh my gosh, you're right, let's save money. It's like, we, no, we need to force these companies to save money. That is such as their hatred of the planet, they would spend money to destroy the planet, right? That, that's what these people are saying. When you it's so, okay. Another element in this, you might say, okay, but the U.S. is such a big you know, player on the world scene, and that's why, you know, they, we really kind of need their participation. That was, you know, true historically. The U.S. was one of the biggest emitters, but just using standard models, so here, you know, I had, um, I, I'm, I'm friends with some climate scientists, and they 
worked up this thing. So th this is not like the right wing model or something. This is standard stuff using a particular scenario that they call A1B in this literature and just saying, okay, if things go, you know, middle of the road projections from this point forward, so wait, you know, this was in early 2017, they ran these numbers between now and the rest of the end of the century, what fraction of total global emissions if governments, you know, keep their current policies in place and don't take aggressive measures to limit things, what are we talking about here? And under this particular scenario, the U.S. was only going to emit about 11 percent of the you know, total emissions going forward in that time frame. You could see China and India were more, and you could see what the U.S. was um, compared to the world total. All right? So again, even on its own terms, if it really made sense to do this thing, then the U.S. pulling out doesn't just, oh, yeah, the whole thing is, is pointless, that it would, it would still make sense for these other countries to do it. So again, just showing that this, these scare tactics and, oh, my gosh, because Trump did this, now the whole thing's worthless. That it doesn't follow. Okay, so so far I've told you how it's that the, these these things, these pledges are kind of nonsensical, and so the whole thing seems a bit dubious, especially when there, there's not um, penalties. So you might you might be thinking, you know, being commonsensical and so forth, and thinking the world surely makes sense at some deep level, right? You probably think that the political sense, at least. You're probably thinking, okay, so what you're saying, Murphy, is if all these governments met the targets that they agreed to, or the, the, you know, if they, the pledges they made, then it would limit it, but you're just saying they're probably going to cheat, right, because there's no penalty. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying even if we look at the pledges they all made, they're nowhere near to meeting that target, okay? So again, just showing you the craziness of it. For example, this was a Vox article. So this guy, David Roberts, is like Vox's in-house expert on climate change issues. He's the person that writes on this stuff all the time. And so this came out in late April, right? So this was well before Trump made his announcement. And what was he saying? No country on earth is taking the two degree climate target seriously. All right, and there was a, I didn't include it because I, I wanted to have room here, but there was a, a photo of earth on fire going along just to make sure you get how serious this is. All right, so the, the point is here, they, they weren't taking it seriously. Here's something from, I apologize, it's, if I blew it up though, it would get fuzzy. Let me just, so this is this, that you can go to a climateactiontracker.org. So this is very much a website in favor of government intervention, right? This isn't like from the Heritage Foundation or so. This is very much in favor of it. And they have this thermometer. And so over here, they've got the pledges. So they're saying if all the governments of the world did the th met the pledges they made when they joined the Paris Agreement, right? If they, if they lived up to those unilaterally imposed obligations, then our best estimate is that would limit warming to 2.8 degrees. Okay, so we're blowing way past the 2C absolute ceiling, even if they all did what they said they were going to do. And then, but there's another nuance. They say, let's, instead of looking at what do they say they were going to do, let's look at their current policies right now and say, if they just kept those in place, what are we on track for? And there, their warming was 3.6 degrees Celsius. Okay, so again, what's my point here is, even just before Trump pulled out, everybody who was like for this thing was saying the governments of the world were not anywhere near hitting this thing. Even if all the participants did what they said they were going to do, we would blow way past this 2C target. Come on, people. So then Trump says, you know what? This whole thing is a sham. We're not doing this. And I was like, oh, my gosh, now we're all dead. <laughs> do you see how like using marginal analysis, you can see, wait a minute, if we were all dead before he did it, and we're all dead after he did it, then him pulling out really isn't why we're all dead, even on your own terms, okay? So that's, that's the importance of marginal analysis for you right there. Okay, so thus far I've shown you, I think, compelling arguments that even if they agreed, to, or even if they met their targets, you know, the things they agreed to, it wouldn't hit it. Clearly, if you look at the weaker thing of what are they actually doing right now, because in other words, you could agree to something that's onerous, and then not follow through with it because it's always politically easier just to kick it down the road, right? Like you could say, yeah, I intend to lose 30 pounds before that wedding. And then, you know, you, and suppose you were 50 pounds overweight. And then you could say, well, even if you did that, you would still be overweight. But then looking and say, you know what? You're not going to the gym. You're keep eating pizza every night. So clearly, if we look at the policy, what you're actually doing, then that's even further away from what you said your goal is. Okay, so you can see, so I've explained to you all that and what a farce this is, but it gets even worse or better depending if you like paradox. <laughs> you, 
again, everybody, it's hard for me to emphasize just how much everybody agrees. Oh, of course, we got to limit it to 2C. That's, that's a given. I mean, you go beyond 2C, we're talking about catastrophe, like ice sheets collapsing and, you know, that all, Bangladesh people being drowned and so forth. It's crazy. And uh, you, you then say, okay, well, surely then the consensus science, this thing that the UN publishes it periodically, the IPCC reports, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this is the thing that codifies all the latest peer-reviewed research in terms of the, you know, the natural science, like just, oh, with emissions of greenhouse gases, what about methane versus CO2? What's the global warming potential of those two gases? You know, that sort of thing. Um, and then they also have things about mitigation efforts, like, okay, what, what steps could governments do? Various things. What about adaptation? Okay, suppose certain warming is inevitable. Will farmers plant crops differently and people might move and will build more dikes and so forth because of sea level rise, right? They have all this stuff, there's humongous volumes of, of documents here or papers summarizing all the literature from the last one. You go to that thing, and I, I tried to do this when it, when it all came out in the last issue, and I was saying, okay, surely I'm gonna be able to see why the two degrees Celsius target makes sense, right? In other words, that using their own numbers the benefits to humanity of limiting emissions to 2C or warming to 2C will clearly outweigh the costs, right? Just the way they, they do things, because they have cost-benefit figures in this document. So surely, and it turned out, no, that, that, that's not true. I can use the UN's own document to make a pretty strong case that the 2C target is a bad idea, right? So th again, th this is what I'm talking about, and I'm gonna come later at the end of this talk to the, a more Rothbardian approach. So I'm not saying in general, Certainly not Rothbardian libertarians are gonna go around running cost-benefit analyses, especially on stuff like this, but I'm just saying to show you how crazy it is, using their own stuff, the cure they're proposing is worse than the disease. All right, so here, um, I realize this might be difficult to see, but just to give you an example, so this was a chart or a table that I took from the last issue of this uh, UN document, and you can see they have uh, the consumption losses in cost-effective scenarios, meaning if governments rationally and efficiently limit warming using the best possible means, which of course in practice governments wouldn't do, but even a best case scenario, this row right here is what they would need to do to limit um, to 2C warming, to have a good chance of doing it. This is the atmospheric concentration. You can see they give numbers. So by the year 2050, they're saying percent reduction in, in consumption relative to the baseline. They're saying, oh, in the year 2050, if governments take measures that would likely limit warming by 2100 to 2C, the economy in the year 2050 will be 3.4% smaller than it otherwise would have been. And by uh, 2100, it'll be 4.8% lower. Okay, so this is the cost of these measures to, to limit global warming, all right? And so then you say, okay, so those are like the costs. The economy as of the year 2100 would be 4.8% lower or the consumption technically, would be 4.8% lower than it otherwise would be. So then you say, okay, so what are the benefits? And so to do that, if you, so think about it. There's gonna be a certain amount of global warming, they say, it's gonna cause damages. And then they're saying, if we limit the warming to 2C by the year 2100, that's gonna cost our economy 4.8%, right? Because now, instead of doing the cheapest ways of produ producing electricity, we gotta you know, switch away from coal-fired plants and go towards wind or solar. Instead of driving cars that use gasoline, more people are gonna switch over to electric cars more quickly than they otherwise would have done, right? So in other words, if we're forcing people to do things differently, then clearly that has a cost. Otherwise they would have done it voluntarily, right? So that's the idea. So they're quantifying. So you say, okay, so the, on their own charts, tables, they're saying it's gonna cost 4.8% by 2100. So what's the benefit? And there, if you think about it, well, it's not just, the gross damages of what's unrestrained global warming gonna do by the year 2100, you gotta use marginal analysis because even on their own terms, if there's 2C of warming, there's still gonna be climate change damages. So to figure out is that it makes sense to do this, you need to look at the change. You need to say what's the likely amount of global warming if we do nothing as governments, how much damage would there be? Then what if we impose these limits to limit it to 2C, how much damage would there be with 2C of warming? And then that difference is how much we've spared ourselves by this, and then how does that compare to the 4.8 number? That's what you would need to do. So I went through that, and they don't even have the numbers in the right form, right? So it's hard to dig that stuff up. But using, 
you know, approximations and looking at various things that they do give you, I could back it up and say, clearly by 2050, it's not even close. And by 2100, it's basically a wash. In other words, if all the governments of the world did things perfectly efficiently, optimally limited, blah, 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 it looks like it's close to being about a wash, but it's still slightly um, worse in terms of the, the cost of the economy. So, you know, isn't that interesting that number one, if you try to run the numbers using their own stuff, it doesn't fully work. It looks at best like it's a wash. But number two, like I say, I had to go through and be a detective and grab stuff. It's not like it's all in one spot. So it's, it's just showing that this is really um, sort of a foregone conclusion that the people participating in this, they already knew that the answer was going to be, oh, we have to do something. They're just trying to like illustrate the specific reasons. But there's nowhere in those things where you could actually see a formal case of, yes, the reason it makes sense using our own methodology or whatever to do this is because here's the cost, here's the benefits. Da, da, da. They, they don't even make that case anywhere. I had to kind of piece it together myself, drawing on various sections of the document. Okay, another little slippery thing, just watch out for. Notice what they did here. They say, where's my thing? Percentage point reduction in annualized consumption growth rate. From here, they said 0.06%. So when this document came out, several years ago, a lot of people were running around and saying, oh, UN says the cost of fighting global change virtually negligible. Because what they're saying here is it will only be a reduction in the rate of growth of 0.06 percentage points. So like if normally the economy around the world would grow at 3%, if we have these policies you know, to fight climate change, then it would only be, what, 2.94%, right? And you think, it's a rounding error. Who get but you, you see the, the sleight of hand there that if you have that little bit of a reduction in the growth rate over 90 years, well, then by this year, you know, that the actual difference between what it would have been and what it isn't is now is a bigger number. And so that's fine. I mean, it's not like the math is wrong, but they weren't then saying, you know, and I did this when these kind of spins came out and I said, oh, UN reports the cost of climate change is, is negligible because I looked at like some of the bad scenarios of what climate change damage would do in the year 2200. And then I just showed, well, you know, even if, in other words, even if there's a 50% a hit to the world by 2200 in terms of the percentage that you need rolling over all that time exponentially to get to that isn't a big number in any one year. And so you could use the same trick just to show, ah, oh, see, it's not a big deal, but of course they weren't framing it like that. So again, just showing that you can take these numbers, you go and read this stuff and see what they're actually saying and it doesn't add up. Another example in this realm is work, the work of William Nordhaus. So I have a, an article in the Independent Review on this. It's called Rolling the Dice, um, Nordhaus's Case for a Carbon Tax or something like that. The, and the, the title is because his model is called the DICE model. It's, a, it's an acronym, you know, D-I-C-E. It stands for what he's doing. And in this thing, so I, I like him. So this guy, in case you don't know him, he has a book. He was one of the guys who for a while was the co-author with Samuelson on his famous textbook. He's been around. Paul Krugman worked, you know, for as a research assistant for him when Krugman was, was in school. Uh, so I mean, if that doesn't recommend him to you, I don't know what would. And, uh, and, and he's one of the pioneers in climate change. He was, his model was one that was picked by the Obama administration of three when they were calculating what's called the social cost of carbon. Okay, so this guy is clearly, you know, he's very much in favor of a carbon tax. He's totally in that camp. And he literally is one of the pioneers in this field of the economics of climate change. Okay, so he's a, he's a huge authority in this, in this area, if you're going to say is somebody an authority. And in this book, he says that, yeah, the two, two degrees Celsius target is, is not very scientific. Right? He's saying that they never, when they just kind of pull that out of the air, there's, there's no justification. And in fact, his own in his own modeling and whatever, he recommends, uh, you know, an opt if, if governments around the world adopted what he thinks is the optimal carbon tax, you know, given the costs and benefits and the externalities and blah, 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 there would be a lot more than two sea of warming in his optimal trajectory of how would the world go if the governments all did what I think is the proper thing economically, adjusting for the externality. All right. So again, just showing you that it's, it's insane that the, the rhetoric has somehow settled on this two C target as clearly we have to do this, and yet the people even from that camp who have you know, run the numbers and stuff, it, it doesn't pop out. Now what will happen is you'll see people say stuff. I've, I've made these, these arguments, and some people will push back, and they'll say things like, uh, well, yeah, but you know, those models, they leave out a lot of stuff. 
And, and yeah, of course they do. I mean, you're building a computer model that's going to simulate the, the climate system and the economy through the year 2100. Yeah, they leave out a lot of stuff, duh. But the point is, we've been lectured to all these years about, oh, you got to follow the science and you know, you're just making up stuff. And so you go and look at their own documents and their own models and so forth. Okay, well, this doesn't justify it. Oh, yeah, well, that, you can't trust those things. You see what I'm saying? So it's like the consensus science is great, except when you go and read it and say, wait, this doesn't justify what you say. And then it's like, well, you can't trust those things. Come on. I mean, there's all sorts of problems with those. That's well known. So they'll also use an insurance analogy, right? So I want to I move on, but I don't have time. But they'll, some people will agree with you up front. Oh, yeah, in terms of what's likely to happen, all these measures we're recommending probably will cost more than they're worth. But, you know, there's a small chance a disaster could strike. And I say, okay, again, and, and I'll say, so like with, with fire insurance or something, it'd be like someone comes up to you now and says, hey, we want to give you to give 3% of your income as a premium because 50 years from now, there might be a fire that at that point would burn down 20% of your house. And in that case, we'll indemnify you for maybe 10% of the cost. Or the, or the damage is it would you you wouldn't buy that kind of an insurance policy but that's kind of what these are being sold as right that it's it's a big hit to the economy up front to spare what is not a catastrophic loss down the road under most projections and then even if there is going to be that outcome what we're doing now is not going to avoid it entirely that that's kind of the the irony here like it's like a catch 22 the worse they make these projections and say look at how awful things are going to be then it's like okay but then the stuff you're proposing wouldn't fix that problem, just like we saw earlier with the, you know, no country on earth is taking the 2C target seriously, that it, it's a, a problem they're in where they're trying to scare people, but yet they realize if what we say is too scary, people are just going to tune us out. So they kind of have to say, oh, no, it's real easy. It's, it's sort of like, if we do nothing, we're all dead, but to fix it, it's really cheap. Don't worry. All the, you know, solar turbines and stuff, they're just around the corner. They're just waiting to pop on the market. We just need a little carbon tax. We'll get it. You know, so, okay. Okay, so I've spent some time just running through the main sort of mainstream analysis here. What would a more Rothbardian approach look like? So let's be clear here. It's not that libertarians are pro-business. All right, You sometimes get that uh, mentality if you watch the political debates in terms of the way it would play out between, like, let's say, conservatives and liberals or whatever. The, the, the standard arguments in the United States context, at least, often seem to sound like Oh yeah, we're, you know, one group cares about jobs and American workers and production, and the other group cares about the environment and, and nature and, and leaving a, a legacy for our, our grandchildren in terms of the beauty of the environment. And that is not the way Murray Rothbard looked at it, right? So he clearly explodes those fallacies and says it's not that libertarians are pro-big business. And he talks about historically how a lot of times, you know, there, there was from the common law tradition like if, if you were down, if you owned a house and you were downstream from some factory that was dumping chemicals in the river, you could get an injunction against that, right? Because they're violating your property rights. Mm -hmm. And it was actually um, you know, government intervention in the name of promoting industrialization that sort of overturned that at the time, right? So it's don't at all fall for this idea that if you're, if you care about the environment, you couldn't possibly be a libertarian. In fact, Walter Block is the editor of a collection called Free Market Environmentalism. Right, so you can see that that's actually a, a phrase, free market environmentalism, whereas to a lot of people, they would think that's, that's a contradiction. On the other hand, though, and I've seen some people try to, people who are for a U.S. carbon tax tried to use Rothbard's name to justify what they were doing because they quoted Rothbard rejecting you know, the move by conservatives who just wanted to say big business could do whatever they want, who cares about the environment, don't, you know, don't be such a whiner. And Rothbard saying, no, that's, that's not correct. And so people quote that. And then they omitted, though, the next thing, though, the next, like, it was literally like the next sentence or two where Rothbard then transitions and says that, on the other hand, it also doesn't follow that we should go for these, quote, market approaches to limiting emissions and so on. Or, so Rothbard, he, wasn't, he was writing before like, climate change was the big deal, so I, I want to be clear. It's not that Rothbard was directly writing on carbon taxes or things like that. He was talking about more like standard pollution and things. But he was saying this idea of like quotas for emission, emissions and the government's going to say, OK, you can emit this much of, of, of things that cause smog in a certain year, and then you can trade them among yourselves, and that's a market outcome. And, and Roth, of course, pointed, that's, how is that a market outcome? You have a bunch of bureaucrats deciding how much total emissions of this type the economy is going to do. That's clearly, that, you know, that's like a, a version of central planning. Yeah, maybe it's more efficient 
than if they're literally telling each firm this is how much you can emit and letting the firms decide through a, a market. But clearly that's not like capitalism, that's not the free market. So what I point out here is uh, sometimes people trying to justify this stuff will say, well, I mean, it's kind of like the tragedy of the commons. And until we had property rights there, you know, people had their, their grazing, animals grazing. And when there wasn't well-established property rights, there was overgrazing. And we fixed that by having property rights and barbed wire fences and blah, blah, blah. And so that's what we're doing with having cap and trade or having a carbon tax. And I say, no, that doesn't follow. Having cap and trade or a carbon tax at the U.S. level is an analogy to this. That would be like when animals were grazing, if the government said, okay, we're going to tax farmers every time their cow takes a bite of grass, but only if it's domestic cows. If foreigners want to come in with their animals and eat the grass, that's fine. Right? And you see how that, that clearly wouldn't solve the tragedy of the commons. That's what it would be like if the U.S. government said to businesses, okay, this is how much you can emit to deal with this problem of climate change, because then if the U.S. government does it, then other countries can still have as much emissions as they want. So that's, it's clearly not solving the problem. Okay, so uh, I only have a minute here. Let me just point you to, if you really want to see, because I know people say, okay, suppose though the science really is saying that there's disaster going to strike unless we sharply reduce emissions. I agree, governments can't be trusted. But what would happen if we had a worldwide anarcho-capitalist system? That's a big question, and I think that's something that you know, future researchers can work on just to flesh out uh, libertarian theory. But the, clearly where you need to go start is Rothbard's article from 1982 on this. Let me, so he talks about property rights. Let me just mention one last thing here is I've seen some people disparaging this and say, oh, the libertarian approach just says property rights, but that's crazy because then that means nobody could do anything, right? Because any little thing you do, if I light a cigarette that emits smoke and that might hit somebody in California or whatever, and so clearly that can't work. And Rothbard's much more nuanced than that, right? He has in there a discussion. He looks at case law. He has a di distinction between nuisances and trespass. Okay, so it's, it's very sophisticated, much more than I've seen other uh, theorists do in terms of what would a, a property rights approach to solving these problems look like. So that's clearly where you need to start. Okay, thanks everybody.